putting ideas on the shelf is a phrase that people use, but I have an actual shelf that I put my ideas on. And there are things from various projects here, but a lot of these do have to do with the expanding table. We've got sample metal arms for the table. We have sample wood ones that I made, sections of track up here. Anyway, we'll go over all this stuff, but I really would prefer not to estimate how much time has gone into this shelf because it's definitely in the days and probably weeks. So let's get some of these. We'll bring them over and go through them. And I think I'll take apart the table also uh, a bit at least in order to help demonstrate what I'm talking about. The point of this video is just to go through some of the things that I went through developing this. You have a good idea and you work on it and it turns out that it's not a good idea and you need a different one. So I think that'll be pretty interesting and you can see why some of these are over here and what went into making them. The basic design strategy for this table, since I had some experience from the wooden one, was to come up with things like the arm shape and get all the main things roughed in, and then I would leave myself room to work out some of the smaller details. And then on a more specific note, I didn't want to design it in a way that required very precise construction. Because you can build things very precisely, but it's time consuming. So what I wanted to do was to make it adjustable so that you can build it close and then adjust it to be accurate. For the spindle, which sits in the center of that and actually holds up the entire thing, I started off with aluminum because everything else is aluminum, why not have this be aluminum? We bored a hole in the end, tapped that for the mounting bolt, and this worked pretty well. But the problem with this is that it's aluminum and it's soft. 
and I put 175 pounds in the end of the arm. So that's 175 pounds, 24 inches out. This is two inches in diameter. So if we assume that the bolt is not a moment connection, so if we assume the bolt is only holding it down, that's over 4,000 pounds of force on one edge, and it would actually deform this slightly. So I upgraded it to a steel spindle, and this is actually a piece of pipe with a solid chunk welded on the end. And this guy has not deformed, no matter what kind of load that I put on it. And this one also gave me room in the center, which I used for some other things. For the bearings, that was quite a search because there's all different kinds of bearings, and you can buy bearings that are super precision and super thin and just whatever you want. One of the first types of bearings that got my attention was called a slewing ring bearing, which is basically, to my understanding, an industrial Lazy Susan bearing. You see great big ones on cranes and things, that's what makes the cab and the, the boom and everything rotate. Even the small ones there are expensive. Uh, you can buy bearings that have very low play and all sorts of other things. Again, very expensive. Because I didn't want to have any more play than I absolutely had to. And so, long story short, what I settled on were taper bearings, like so. These are wheel bearings, as I've mentioned before, from an F, originally designed for an F-350 pickup truck. And the thing with taper bearings is that if you have two of them and you compress them, that takes out any play. They have a tendency to jam up, so you have to be rather careful. If you put them on there right, they go on very easy, but it can be deceiving. We need a way to hold these in place though, and what we're going to use for that is this hub. This is the main hub for the, for the table. The center is a four and a half inch quarter wall aluminum pipe. The outside is eight inch uh, quarter wall pipe. And in the center, I have a flange, which is not, you can't really see that well, but there's a flange at the bottom that this bearing sits in. And then we have this piece, which is also has a, a lip on it and that slips over the top. And so what this does is it sits in here, and then we have some screws with uh, truss heads on them and washers, and that compresses down on this while pulling up on the bottom here, and that enables our, after we mount this to the plate, our hub to spin like that. The hub is actually epoxied together because at the time I didn't want to goof with aluminum welding, or I hadn't gotten the equipment in practice at least yet, and I cleaned it very carefully. I wire brushed it, did all the things that they talk about. This isn't anything exotic, it's just the Loctite brand of metal epoxy. And it's worked great. I've tested this thing with some pretty decent loads and not had any issues at all, so I guess that's my recommendation on it. The nice thing about epoxy is that I did have to put some thinner pieces in on the bottom here. And even if I wanted to weld those now that I know what I'm doing, it'll have a tendency to distort it. Epoxy is a cold process, so it was helpful since I'd already fitted it to the bearing. All of these strategies are going away in the future, but at the time I just needed something to, to make it work. These bearings are not sealed, so they will require some sort of lubrication, and then you want that lubrication to stay in the bearing. You don't want it to leak out of the mechanism and down onto people's floors. So that's something that I've planned in future versions. It's not present here, but it has been addressed. I mentioned the epoxy that I used on this, and I did try using a spool gun on some of the early arms that I welded. These are spool gun welds on here. And I gotta say that that spool gun was very frustrating. I'm not the kind of person who, who throws things when they get angry, but I came very close with that thing because you would clean it, you prep it, you get ready, you preheat it, you're welding along, everything is going just fine, and then it stops. You can see, anyway, if you're closer, you can see evidence of this sort of thing. Everything's going fine, and then it stops. And it is absolutely infuriating because it piles up and you have to undo it. Anyway, I think spool guns are good for certain things. They're not good for stuff like this. The arm shape is an interesting thing because it started out with the basics piece like this, and I wanted to have the lowest mounting point possible to make it as strong as possible. I also had some curves in here because curves prevent stress concentrations. The problem with this, of course, is that you have to cut this out of a piece of material, 
and the widest pieces that I could get my hand, hands on easily were six inches, so I had to weld it together here, which required a lap joint on the inside. This is all with the spool gun, mind you. It became <laughs> enormously time consuming, and in order to make these shapes easier, I came up with a template like this so that I could route around it, but trying to route around something thin like this, of course, causes a lot of wobble. So what I built was a template like this, where you would register the top factory edge against here, and it would give you more support. Except, of course, that I had welded the pieces together down low, as I mentioned here, so I had to move, remove material there. You have to do it on both sides because you have pieces which are going on either side. But the arm shape has eventually become simplified because this is way, way too complicated. It requires too much welding, and it causes problems with distortion because the weld metal shrinks so that your top is not flat. The arms became greatly simplified. This is the original strategy. These are the arms that you saw in the actual working one. This is not the final version. It gets simplified even further. But what I ended up doing to account for the distortion after I got the welding more or less under control was to have a 5 16th piece on the top and then mount it up in a jig, which became also very time consuming. Fly cut the top, mill the tracks down the side, which is something I'll talk about in a minute with the carts. So there's a lot of time that went into these, trying to weld these. Uh, I didn't want to have weld. Trying to weld on the outside with the spool gun is quite difficult, so I welded these on the inside to here. I bent the pieces around here and then tried to weld those. When it comes to mounting these arms on the hub, what I did was to cut a concave shape into these pieces here and then weld those from the inside so that this can match up to the hub and fit nicely on the radius and then it can be rotated like so to align it or shimmed a little bit on the bottom to control the elevation at the end. You're familiar with the hub now. This is our base hub, but we also have our raising hub, which needs to go on the outside. So how are we going to attach this? Because this needs to be free only in the vertical axis. And that's kind of a tricky thing to do because I need it to be quite a close fit and I need it to be adjustable. My first strategy that I thought was to use some CNC rails. So I bought some overstock, I guess you could call them CNC rails or leftovers from someone else's project. And they didn't have anything for scale in the photo and I didn't really think too hard about the rails. So I ended up with these bad boys, which are pretty hefty. They're solid CNC rails and obviously much, much too large. So that idea was out, although they do make good parallels for the mill. If you wanna raise something up off the table, for example, to drill a hole, that way you don't have to have a sacrificial piece underneath. So what I ended up doing with this thing was to use just aluminum pieces for the verticals and then to use some low friction plastic on here. And the plastic has a set screw which goes into it that can be cranked in or out. And that gives you the ability to adjust your wear surface, not just side to side, but also like this, because that uh, lets you accommodate the variability in welding this thing. This thing is a little bit of a, a trick to weld. I'll get to that in a minute. But that gives me some flexibility. I can also adjust the entire system like this in case the raising arms are not exactly 45 degrees to the other ones. It doesn't give you a lot of variability, but I can build it pretty close, like I said, and then adjust it so that it's accurate. This raising hub has consumed quite a lot of thought time for me. It needs to go up and down, but only by one inch. And then that motion also needs to be translated into lifting the star, which is in the center. My original strategy for this was to try and keep the ramps, which lift everything up inboard, meaning inside of this hub, for various reasons. And my sort of master stroke plan here was to have these pieces You would have two of them, and they would start out low, and then as they rotated, they would hit a ramp, and the ramp would lift up the entire thing. This part would go up, 
half an inch. It would go up one inch here to lift the main parts and it would go up two inches at the end to lift the star. The problem with this thing is that it's very touchy and that if you have a, something which is riding on here, it depends on where it is, how far it goes up and down. So if it has any flexibility at all, it will go up or down less. And there could be potentially quite a bit of force on this raising hub. So that idea was kind of out. These consumed a lot of time though. There's a threaded thing and then a Delrin bushing in here and milling this curved shape. You can see the holes that these wheels would go through in the bottom here. So they would have sat like so. We had to chamfer the edge on there to go around the epoxy joint on the inside. And also working at the bottom of the hub is just difficult. You can't get your hands in there. Everything has to be done with tools. And the way that the raising hub here would ride on this when this was on the inside is that it would reach in. So here's our raising hub and there's a piece which would reach in like this inside the hub and then down to these pieces. And as you can see on here, I thought about having a spring assist to help with the weight. So this would actually reach through a, a slot like this into the inside as the raising hub is going up and down. We have a Delrin thing there, we have a spring here. In order to adjust the spring, this is a bolt which is threaded and can be turned to pre-tension the spring or to adjust them. There were spots for one here and then one on the other side as well. That spring assist thing went out the window. I decided that it was complexity, which is not required, so it's out. The challenge with the star is that this main raising hub goes up and down one inch, but that star has to go up and down two inches. So you have to have something to multiply the distance there. My next strategy on that was to have a gearing system. I thought this will be great. I'll use gears. What it would do is it would sit inside the hub, basically. It would multiply it to go up and down two on this, which would lift the star up and down. Meshing on gears is very important. And the problem with rack gears is that in order to control that depth of meshing into the, the round gear, you have to have surfaces which are very close to the rack gear. And that can create more friction when any gunk gets in there. It'll, it'll gum it up and create problems. It just wasn't working that well. Whereas with regular rotary gears, they're on an axle and you can adjust that axle a little more easily to control the meshing. So it just didn't, it didn't work that well. But this comes apart and you can see the inside. Tried low friction tape, none of it worked. So this was out. What I ended up doing was going back ultimately to something similar to the wood table, which is a lever system here. And what this does is that it reaches inside so we have our main hub here, our raising hub is out here, and this bolts onto here, okay? So this is now reaching inside of the raising hub. It's in here. This part will fit in there, trust me. And what we do is we use this piece here, which has a bolt which can be turned, as I mentioned, to adjust the height, and that keeps one end down. So we keep this end down, and then when we lift up the center by one inch, this end goes up and down two, and by adjusting the point which is constraining this end, we can adjust the end point so that the star comes to, to just the right height. We're gonna talk about the arms now. This was the very first arm that I made, which was based on the routing template and all of that. And this also goes back to the cart strategy because you have to have a cart that rides on top of here. And I looked and looked and looked and researched rails. And there are lots of really great rail systems out there. They're designed for industrial things. They're very expensive. I have eight of these, which are roughly 18 inches long. And it was just gonna be incredibly expensive. I mean, some of these things are, they'll say, oh, it's 50 cents per unit. Okay, what's the unit? It's millimeters. I mean, the cost is just incredible. If you're building a $100,000 industrial machine, that's fine, but not for this. It's also much more accurate than I need. 
So what I ended up settling on for my initial strategy was to, that's actually not true. My initial strategy was to use pre-formed, uh, you know, extrusions for the thing and to have, I, I widened these slots here and then to use wheels which looked like this. These are made out of Delrin. So these fit like so and would ride in that slot. The idea here was that the cart needs to be able to resist forces in just about every direction. It should only allow motion this way. So I tried having wheels like this. For the cart itself, I need the cart to fit fairly tightly. So I started off with a cart that is milled in a tongue and groove set up here with a cross bolt. And that cross bolt allows you to just change this width a little bit and give it some flexibility. I eventually went away from this because it was heavy and expensive. And then what we went to was this arm, now back to this. And what I was gonna do was to use a woodworking router bit initially and mill down these sides to give them a convex profile and then make my own wheels, which would go onto here and allow the cart to ride back and forth. The width is not set correctly, but basically it would go like that. And then in order to limit the overall width, I simply used shoulder bolts on uh, Delrin. And if you get the clearance just right here, just a few extra thousandths, it'll spin pretty freely. Even though Delrin's low friction and all that, by the time you, if you, if you tighten it down a little bit, it creates drag and it didn't work that well. The problem with the cross bolt system is that it is adjustable, but once you adjust it to that point, it stays there. So if you need even a few extra thousands to get over a, an irregularity in here, it, it kind of jams up and it doesn't work that well. You can't see it on these cars, on these arms, but all of the, the main arms have been milled on the top to be flat. That accounts for the welding distortion that I mentioned earlier, and then milled down the side for to, uh, give it this convex profile that was also quite a lot of time so what i went to on the carts was a flex joint type cart i also went to three wheels you can see originally that i had four mounting spots i went to a type of cart where there's there are wheels here and a wheel here there's a slot and then a cross bolt here and so that tightens it down these would be aluminum normally they're wood here because wood was easier to work with and serve the purpose for a demonstration. So you tighten this down and then you have that flexibility of the metal pulling this wheel in. It gives it just a few thousandths of flexibility and that'll let it go over debris and irregularities. The wheel system that I eventually went with is from Open Builds. I don't know if that's the site or the name of the thing, but it's, I think it's called Open Rail is the rail. These are aluminum rails and they're V-shaped. I had originally gone with concave wheels and the idea there was that you have the round rail shape and I wanted to have as much uplift resistance as possible. And so since it reaches all the way around the bottom, I thought that that would give it good uplift resistance. But the problem with the shape like this is that it has a gradual ability to, for the wheel to come out and that creates more and more resistance reaching inwards. It doesn't self, self center as dramatically as a, a V-shaped wheel does. And so you get more drag there. That was an issue. If there's any lack of parallelness at all also with these type of things, it'll tend to jam up with four wheels, which is why I went with the three setup. It accommodates issues and irregularities like that better. When it came to making these wheels also, I didn't just turn a few of these by hand. This is one set of wheels. These were done by hand. But then I wanted to create others and I didn't want to have to do these and use the calipers each time. So I, I made some jigs for making these wheels. So what I would do is take the Delrin, chop saw it to rough length, and then I made this thing which is a flex clamp for the mill. So it sits in the vise and then you, you just clamp it and it'll squeeze the piece. You then drill it and then ream it to the right inside dimension. Then I have this, which is a fixture which goes in the mill and it's a little too short so that you can face the end. You, you, you jam the wheel on there and then you face it. And then you thread this screw in to the end, 
which clamps it after you flip it around and then you can uh, do it and use our profile cutter that I talked about in the video to cut that groove in there. So I actually had it down where I could create these wheels quite, quite quickly and accurately. And it was right after I got this process dialed in that I found the open builds wheels and that stuff. So it seems to be a recurring theme that you look and look and look for the right solution and you just can't find it. You say, all right, I'm going to do it myself. And you come up with the jigs and the tools and, and work out all the problems and you get some, some stuff produced and then you find another solution. So I guess that's just the way that it goes. For the ramps on the skirt, those were quite tricky because the ramp has to curve. It has to be ramped and then also curve around with that radius. And so my original strategy for this was to make them out of aluminum for various reasons and then try to bend them. I was trying to use my 15% rule that I talked about in the bending video, which does not apply when you get to thicker material, evidently. I built this thing, which is a bending, well, I thought it would be a bending jig for the floor jack, where it hooks over the bottom of the floor jack and then you crank it up and it'll press these pieces against a mold. Unfortunately, the problem with milling on smaller pieces is, is that it's very difficult to hold on to them, so you have to fasten them down with screws. I fastened this one down with a screw, which weakened that area, and when I bent it, it bent there. I tried it with other pieces that didn't have the screw hole, and they just didn't bend. They, they flexed and then came right back. We were still in the elastic region, which is partly a function of using the 6061 T6 material, so kind of shot myself in the foot with that. But I did make four very nice ramps, which were unusable. So we'll put those back on the shelf. What I eventually settled on, well, before I got to that, actually, I tried making it out of wood. But the problem with wood, again, is you have to hold it. Uh, it has a tendency to creak when you put loads on it. And the wood was just time consuming. When you have to mill it like this, you end up wasting a lot of material also. So the ideal strategy will be to have something which is thin and you can cut it to the right angle and then form it around. So that's why I went with plastic. You can watch more of that in my ABS toaster oven thermo forming video. For the carts, we've got these rolling back and forth quite well, but you may need to adjust your panels for them to be very precise. So on top of these, I have adjustment plates. And what these have are three set screws on there. And then by adjusting the height of the set screws, you can adjust the plate like this. The thing about set screws, of course, is that all they do is hold it up. You need something to hold it down because you want to be able to adjust it. But once you adjust it, you want it to stay there. You don't want it to just float away. So we have a bolt which comes up from the bottom and tightens it down. So when you want to adjust these, what you do is you move these out to a certain place. Now these are the center adjustment screw and the main bolt lines up with a hole in the bottom of the arm. If you need to translate the piece, we have oversized holes here with some washers that are uh, cupped so they don't fall in and pull, pull it back to the center. That allows you to go like this. Once you clamp it down, these things aren't going anywhere. So this gives you adjustment like this. It gives you adjustment like this. I guess it gives you some rotation also. So that uh, lets you adjust the panels and get them quite close. It's not a lot of adjustment, but you shouldn't need a lot of adjustment. It should be quite close. The arms mount to the front of these carts to push them in and out. The arm shape is always kind of a time consuming thing to develop. I tried again to try and use nice arcs and work that out, but it doesn't work. You end up with more of an L type shape. So I made these out of wood first because it's time consuming to make them out of metal. These arms have to mount to something in the center and that's this octopus type plate. That started off looking like this and then evolved into something looking like this, which actually got some use, hence all the dirt. And then it evolved into this, which is made out of quarter inch hot roll and it's got some weight to it. But I have to have this almost entirely open on both sides, so I need the maximum amount of stiffness. And the elastic modulus of steel, basically the stiffness, is about triple that of aluminum, so steel it was. To guide the star up and down, we talked a little bit about the part which makes it adjustable for the lifting, but not exactly on how it goes up and down. So this is the actual plate that holds the star. This is the part which sits on top of our wheel 
that we talked about and gets lifted up and down. That's all that this does is lift it up and down. So we've got three things here. This is the guide, which keeps the entire thing vertical and lets it go up and down. This does the lifting up and down, and then this helps follow the angle around to make it turn. Making it turn is a function on the hub of this slot, and this can be adjusted back and forth. That lets you adjust it that way. So we have full adjustment on our star thing, which is quite handy because trying to mount that star blind to this plate exactly right and then make adjustments would be very frustrating. So I wanted to make it as adjustable as possible. How to guide this part up and down in the center with very low friction. We are lifting it off center. It will have a tendency to shift. So this needs to be low friction. This also, again, needs to be affordable, something that I can build. And this needs to be dead in the center of the mechanism. You can't have this off center. It's not gonna work. It's gonna interfere with everything else. So it needs to be right in the center. That's where our pipe comes in handy. If you were careful when you turned it, and I was, you made sure that this is turned so that we have an even wall thickness all around here. And what I'm able to do is to drop in some bushings. These are white Delrin. So what, what, what we need basically is a set of bushings like this that allow it to go up and down. That seems pretty simple, but they need to have a very close fit in order for this to be uh, very precise. And they have to be dead parallel to keep it from dragging. This is kind of like sliding the bearings onto here. When they're lined up just right, they go on very easily. But if they're off a little bit, they jam up and it's, it's a major problem. So how do we do that without trying to run screws in from the outside and, and just taking a lot of time to build that? What I did was I took this as pipe, put this on the lathe so that it's turning. I face the end, flip it, get it dialed in again, uh, face it again. So I know that these two surfaces are parallel. Since I turned this face parallel to this one before I welded it and then when I tacked it, I know that the top of this solid block is flat and perpendicular to this axis. So I can drop this in there. Okay, this has been faced on both sides. I know that these are parallel. I put that in like that. Then another pipe, same as this one, is on top of there. I have another bushing which goes on top of here. And this whole assembly now allows this to go up and down. And when I pull this thing out, I mean, it goes pop. You can hear the, the suction. So it's, it's a quite a tight fit. And this is turned to just the right diameter, like this, so it doesn't rattle. I actually went slightly under when I made these, so I had to put some set screws in there. But these sit in there. I know that they're dead in the center. I know that they are parallel to each other. So it goes up and down. It's Delrin, it's easy to, to ream to get a smooth fit on here. And it's very low friction, it works quite well. These do need to be held down though. It won't work for them to be floating around. They'll tend to lift up, they need to be held down. This is the piece which sits on the top, which holds the octopus type plate. The holes are not drilled directly across because it's uniquely registered on the angle. So they're set up like that. We have this piece, which needs to sit on top of here and preferably hold this down. If I try to set up the distances and drill the holes in just the right place to hold these down, that would be annoying. So what I want to do is get it close and then have something flexible in there to hold it down. In this case, I'm using silicone tubing, which is like so, so that it fits, it springs out so that it stays away and does not interfere with the center. Then this is compressed on top of that and fastened from the side. Then all of this has to reach through our metal plate, as you saw, because the Since this sits on here and these pieces have to reach down, this entire plate cannot rotate because everything else is rotating around it. That's what enables the arms to change their position and force the carts out. So this has to go down through here, and these pieces reach through, which also means that your entire table has to rotate less than 180 degrees, because if it rotated 180 degrees, the piece which starts here would go all the way to here, and there would be no way to hold up this part. Everything that's out here is rotating. The only way to hold this plate is in the center. If you look at this, 
and maybe squint a little bit, you can see what looks to be a tuning fork. It does have a tendency to vibrate, which is why I have Delrin wheels on here. I had too many metal to metal connections earlier, and when this was sliding down the part that controls it this way, it was causing it to ring through all the other parts. So I've, I've added Delrin in at different points so that they're no longer strictly metal to metal connections and that's helped out quite a bit. When it came time to weld this hub together, you can't just sit there and cross your fingers and hope that it comes out in a nice octagon. You need a jig to do it. And so I made this jig out of wood and it worked pretty well. You think, well, wood isn't you know, good for, for welding metal. It'll, it'll catch on fire. Well, aluminum conducts heat pretty well. I used my brain a certain amount. I did not get it roasting hot. I had some washers on here spacing it out. It did start smoking a bit, but it held up fine and I got very good results. One other thing that I experimented with on this was putting a damper on the rotation of the table so that if someone got a little too enthusiastic, it wouldn't slam into it and cause damage. So what I came up with for that was something you can see a little bit of here. What I did was to take a ball bearing ball and TIG weld that just very carefully so that you have a protrusion on this fixed spindle. And then this is a damper. And this piece actually reaches through the hub. So if you look carefully, these, uh, so these are the spline pieces, these are the mounting holes. And this right here is a hole which goes straight through up into the center near where the spindle is. So this ball is going to be in here and rotating around and then through these holes this thing would pass and then it would catch that ball when it got to the end of its travel and it would damp it. Now building something like this is simple conceptually but not as simple in practice because if you use air, it'll tend to bounce. You have to damp it somehow. You have to have small holes. There's more that goes into it than initially meets the eye. So what I did was I made this out of a Blum cabinet damper. I did not like the packaging that was around it. I took this piece of metal and I bored it out. It has a set screw in the end to control the depth of start. Then we have our actual little hydraulic cylinder here, and then that goes into this Delrin thing, and then all of it slips back together to create our damper. The entire thing is fastened with set screws from the top. The problem that I had with this was that that table, you're applying force as the person out near the edge. This is in near the center. You want this near the center because then it's acting directly on the hub, so it's symmetrical, the resistance that it puts out to everything else but you also have a lot more force because the leverage is greater here. And I, it did slow it down, but if you had a lot of enthusiasm, I could see it just bursting this thing from the pressure or causing it to, to fail. So you really need a much more aggressive damper. I was thinking probably something like uh, mountain bike dampers, some other application like that where they're for the, for the rear suspension, where they're designed for short travel and higher forces. It does make your alignment a little trickier because you have a unique angle at which this has to attach to the bottom plate because the bottom plate attaches to the ramps. And then this angle is very specific. And then the angle at which this goes in here is specific because this plate has to be registered to it so that your arm extension synchronizes with everything else. There's a lot of unique angles involved with the spindle here and I felt like this extra one wasn't wasn't really worth the trouble. If somebody really wants to slam the thing closed and damage it, I'm not going to be able to prevent that. They're just going to damage it, and that's not really my concern. So I decided to hold off on this for now. So I've talked for quite a bit here. I think I've gone through all the major components. I can feel myself starting to get just a little bit hoarse, so I'll stop while I'm ahead. And I hope that this was informative. I was a little bit rambling and all of that, but that kind of reflects the development. You work on one thing till you get stuck, then you order some parts, you work on something else. It's quite a process. I think this illustrates why all of this stuff takes so much time. And a lot of these interior parts, it's not even just building them, right? You get it in there and it doesn't work and you can't see why it's not working. So you have to take it apart. Just a lot of trial and error and assembly and disassembly and 
hopefully we'll get some serious attention here, get a deposit on hand, and, and start working on the next version. Yeah. Thank you for watching.